So the final talk, as, I, as I'm sure you're all aware, is da Daniel Grun from Stanford, and he's going to tell us about year one from DES. I'm sure we're all very excited to hear this talk. All right. Does this work? It's a great pleasure to be here today to give you a review talk on dark energy. Uh, but it is an even greater pleasure because in the second part of that talk, I get to present cosmological constraints that we have derived from the first year of observations in the dark energy survey. So I'll, I'll try to keep up the suspense a little bit by, by starting with the review part. So I'm going to give you an introduction to dark energy, looking at how we can observe the effects of dark energy and how we can possibly explain uh, those effects in the universe. And I'll walk you through some recent results uh, from related studies, mostly by comparing the geometry of an expanding universe against the growth of structure in that universe, and comparing observations made in the very early universe, like the one that Mark just told us about, against observations made in the very late universe, the evolved universe today. And then after that, we'll see what DES can add to that picture. So even in Chicago, if you take a baseball and you hit it really hard, eventually it'll come back down. It'll do something like this. If you use technology and you shoot it fast enough, Maybe it'll keep going, it'll escape the Earth's orbit, but on its path, it'll slow down further and further. That's the only thing it can do because gravity from, from the Earth keeps pulling. Much the same happens in the universe that contains matter and you know, other things that we know, like, like radiation. The scale factor of the universe, A, may change over time. The universe is expanding, but as A gets larger, that expansion slows down, and so you know, that's what we expected the universe to do until we found that it wasn't at all what the universe was doing. In fact, right now, we're in this phase of an accelerated expansion. Uh, and this is sort of what we think the universe has done since, since it started over time. The scale factor is now accelerating uh, uh, to increase again. And the simplest way that you can account for that is if you add a term to this equation, which is just a constant, uh, a constant vacuum energy density, uh, that, that we call dark energy or a cosmological constant, and it'll do this um, for you. Now, there are a couple additional parameters that you need to describe this very simple universe. Uh, you need an amplitude of density fluctuations. You need this matter density at the present time. You need a mass density of neutrinos. You need the expansion rate today. Uh, you need the scale dependence of early density fluctuations. But for the most part in our talk, uh, in my talk, it's enough to remember this fiducial lambda CDM model in which omega matter is 0.3, so 30% of the matter density in the universe today is in the form of matter, most of it dark matter, a little bit of it baryons. The rest of it is in this cosmological constant, 70%, and then the amplitude of structure formation is 0.8 in whatever unit someone decided to define that. Before we go into more detail, I think let's take a step back and, and realize just how remar remarkably odd of a model that is. I just told you that 70% of the energy content of the universe is an unknown substance. It appears like vacuum energy. In fact, it is 120 orders of magnitude smaller than the vacuum energy that QFT would predict. Uh, I told you that something like 80% of matter is an unknown substance that acts gravitationally like matter, but that's the only interaction that we have found it, it has at all. And yet we have a wide range of independent observations that you can't explain without these two strange assumptions. Now you could say, well, maybe there's an explanation behind it that's somehow easier. Um, possibly the opposite is true. So, so here's a theorem uh, about alternatives to that model. Uh, the Lovelock theorem says that general relativity and a cosmological constant is the only local second order gravitational field equation that can be derived from a four dimensional action that is constructed only from the metric tensor. Uh, and so if you want a different explanation than just this constant that pops up in your equation, you have to break one of these assumptions. There's a whole zoo of theories that break very, you know, different, uh, a different one of these assumptions. And you know, different people have a different taste as to what they find attractive. But experimentally, uh, I think this zoo means that what we should do is make phenomenological tests of this most simple model, lambda CDM. 
And so there, there are three types of questions uh, that one could ask that are you know, good starting points of finding out about dark energy. One question is, are the data that we've collected from the early universe and the data we collected from the late universe fit by the same parameters in this very simple model? Or is there something else going on in the billion years between uh, that Lambda CDM doesn't describe? Do measurements of cosmic distances of the geometry of the universe and measurements of the growth of structure in that universe agree with each other? Or is, is the expansion of the universe governed by a different physical mechanism than the growth of smaller structures inside of it? And thirdly, does the dark energy density change as space expands? Is it really a cosmological constant vacuum energy density, or is it, is it changing over time? And an equivalent question to ask is what is the equation of state parameter of dark energy that we call W, which is just the ratio of the pressure of dark energy over its density. All right, so how can we try to answer these questions? Uh, there's, there's really two types of effects that dark energy has on the universe. And one is it changes the expansion of the universe. That's how it was discovered. The universe is accelerating its expansion. The second is, it changes how structures grow in that universe for the same reason. Structures grow in the universe, but the accelerated expansion of the universe slows down that process, so structures grow, uh, grow not quite as fast. And so you can design probes that test different combinations of these effects. There's a group of probes that are primarily sensitive to the geometry, to the expansion, and I'll call them expansion history, and walk through them in a second. There's another group of probes that are primarily sensitive to the growth of structure. They have some sensitivity to, to the geometry as well, but mainly they probe what structures are like and how they grow in, in the evolved universe. And so these two groups I'm going to talk about. The question always is, do all these measurements agree with predictions in this same simple fiducial lambda CDM model? And so let's start with measurements of the expansion history. Uh, and essentially, the way they work is you compare the redshift of objects, which is the size the universe had when, you, when light was sent out from that object, to, to the distance that, that you measured to that object. And there's two ways of doing that. One is using standard rulers. That is, you take a physical scale that you know, and you just measure the angle in the sky that you see this scale under. The further away that thing is, the smaller that angle hopefully will be. Um, and so there's one convenient scale that is set by the cosmic microwave background, and Mark has told you about that, which is the sound horizon in the early universe. In the early universe, sound waves travel until at some point they freeze out. Uh, and so this sets a scale that you can measure very precisely in the cosmic microwave background. Um, so you can measure the angular diameter distance to the universe when it was just 380,000 years old. Now this scale imprints itself on the matter field, and the matter field turns into a galaxy field. So you can measure the same acoustic scale, the scale of baryonic acoustic oscillations, BAO, in the universe at later times. It's just expanded alongside the, the, the expansion of the universe. So this plot here shows this sort of comparison. Okay? You measure the BAO scale in the cosmic microwave background, and you predict the angle it should have at later times. And then you look at the correlation function of galaxies in different surveys, look at galaxies that are at different redshifts, and you compare your measurement of the BAO scale to that prediction. And so what you see is this, this gray area is the fiducial lambda CDM model, Planck's measurement of the BAO scale. All these measurements within their errors are consistent, are consistent with that scale. There's a second way that you can probe the expansion history which is using standard candles. So you measure the brightness of sources with known intrinsic luminosity. And so one very convenient uh, such type of objects are supernovae of type 1a. Their luminosity can be determined with little scatter uh, if you measure the duration of the supernova outburst and its color. And so what you can do is you can measure a lot of supernovae. And this study did that combining uh, the most recent data sets and you can just see you know, how dim they are as a function of what redshift they are at. And that allows you to measure what we call uh, the luminosity distance uh, as a function of redshift. And again, there's a line going through all these points here. And that line is the prediction of what the luminosity distance to this supernova should be 
in a uh, fiducial lambda CDM universe. So combinedly, these measurements of the expansion history are, uh, provide a consistent measurement, and they very tightly constrain cosmological parameters. They constrain the matter density and the density of dark energy, uh, which means they constrain the universe to be very close to flat. And they also constrain the dark energy equation of state parameter to be very close to minus one. So they uh, tell us that dark energy, as far as expansion is concerned, is very close to a cosmological constant. Let's look at measurements of late time structure. That's a very different thing. Uh, we're interested in how strong gravitation was in building objects in the late time universe. And so there's different ways, again, that you can do this. Uh, one is redshift space distortions. If you look at the clustering of galaxies by measuring their redshifts and positions in the sky, you'll find that the clustering in redshift is different from the clustering in, in angular position because these galaxies are moving. They're, in fact, falling into structures that are still forming. And so you can measure how quickly galaxies are falling into these structures by these redshift space distortions, as we call them. You can measure the growth rate of these structures in the universe. And again, this is a plot. You know, you measure cosmological parameters with Planck, you make a prediction for what the growth rate should be at different redshifts, and that's this gray band. And then you go ahead and perform lots of galaxy surveys that measure redshift space distortions, and you find that the growth of structure that you measure is consistent with this simple prediction and measurement at the cosmic microwave background. You can do something very different uh, and look at galaxy clusters. Uh, you can essentially just count galaxy clusters as a function of their mass and redshift that you find in, uh, in any particular survey. And so this plot um, shows this for the South Pole Telescope SC cluster sample. Uh, as a function of redshift, this is how many clusters uh, they have found in, in their survey with the South Pole Telescope. Uh, and then this gray band here shows their best fit model, which is consistent with the fiducial lambda CDM. And so, you know, what, they, what you can tell from this is that they find roughly as many clusters as they expect to find in a fiducial lambda CDM model as a function of redshift. Structure seems to be building up at this high end of the very massive objects at the rate that we would expect. You can use this to do a cosmological analysis and combine these results with other probes, and that's what's been done in this paper by Mans et al. And what you see is that clusters provide independent constraints with a different degeneracy of parameters. And if you join them with these geometric probes of CMB, supernovae, and BAO, you get a very tight constraint on, in this case, uh, the matter density and the equation of state parameter, uh, which is this little orange dot here right at the spot of our fiducial lambda CDM cosmology. So clusters check out as well. Now, if, if you find that somehow non-remarkable, making all these measurements and having them agree with this crazy model. Consider, consider I had this crazy business idea yesterday. It mostly involves things that you cannot see. Uh, and I, I tell you all about it. Uh, and then I tell you that if you invest $10 today, I'm going to pay you back a million, plus or minus maybe 5%, 100 years from now. If you think that's a reasonable proposal, I accept cash and checks at the exit later. If you don't think that's a reasonable proposal, then, then you should agree that we should take these measurements made at a very early stage in the universe, very tiny fluctuations of the density, just 10 to the minus 5, and compare them to measurements of the structure in the late universe with density fluctuations that are much larger than unity, and see whether you know, those two things really match in all ways possible. And so. There's one way I haven't talked about yet, uh, which has brought us some intriguing results recently, uh, which is cosmic shear, gravitational lensing. So there are some recent studies uh, that have claimed a two to three sigma offset between measurements of cosmological parameters that Planck has made using the cosmic microwave background and measurements using gravitational lensing uh, of, um, you know, specifically the matter density and the amplitude of uh, structure in the late time universe. So in this plot, you just see the CMB predictions. The red one is the Planck contour, the best such measurement that's been made. And you see what these lensing surveys have found. Uh, the gray and the green are two independent lensing surveys as this somewhat banana-shaped contours. And you see that there is a bit of an offset. Now, 
opinions differ as to what that offset means. Uh, you know, it's a matter of taste. Some people say that's a non-issue. It's not a very significant difference. Maybe you'll just find something like that occasionally. It is intriguing to think of this as a crack in lambda CDM. Maybe something different is happening than what lambda CDM would predict, and it causes this lensing signal to be measured you know, a little lower. Or maybe there's a systematic error, either in the cosmic microwave background experiments or in these lensing experiments. And really, that's causing this, this small difference. So that's reason enough to have a closer look at this and you know, put in as much data and analysis power as we can. And in the remainder of my talk, that's what I'm mostly going to talk about. So we're running this survey called the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, we stabilized uh, a telescope in, in Chile, and we installed a great camera on it. We're using that to image 5,000 square degrees of the southern extragalactic sky in five filter bands, G, R, I, Z, Y, uh, mostly optical, some slightly near infrared. We're taking 10 exposures of each part in that survey and each filter band over a duration of five years. And there are roughly 400 scientists analyzing and processing that data. The primary goal of the dark energy survey is to constrain the dark energy equation of state and make an independent measurement to, to compare these other constraints with using mostly these four probes. Large scale structure, which is the distribution of galaxies in our survey, type 1a supernovae that we find in, a, in, a, in dedicated subfields that we visit frequently, counting clusters of galaxies similar to the way this SPT probe has done it, and gravitational lensing, which I'm going to talk about more. The status of our survey is that there is a first set of data we took in a science verification season. It's, it's a small area of the sky to the full depth of our survey. Most of the science is done, and you can find all the catalogs online and repeat it or do something else if you like. What I'm going to talk about today is the first year of real scheduled science observations. It's 1,500 square degrees of the sky, about a third of our survey to about 40% of its final depth. The data is processed, and today is the day we release cosmology results. We are in the process of vetting catalogs from three years of observations, which will cover the full survey at comparable depth. And we've actually taken data um, for four years now, uh, and so we have our full survey at about 70% uh, of its final depth. And this is just a picture that shows you that we're doing quite well. Most of the parts of the sky in I-band, we have taken you know, between six and eight exposures, but actually most of them seven. Uh, so uh, it's working. It's working very well. Now, the results I'm going to present are really in no way my own. Uh, they are made by a large, mostly very happy group of people, uh, many of which you see on this picture, some of which you actually see in this room, uh, and people who are spread out over many institutions in the US, but also uh, in Great Britain, Spain, Brazil, Australia, uh, and Switzerland, and Germany. Um, so. Uh, it's really due to them that, that we could get to this point. Now, a brief introduction to gravitational lensing, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's really very simple. When the light of a background galaxy passes by a massive foreground structure, it feels that gravity and its light path gets bent. This causes a shifting of the position of that galaxy, a magnification of the image of that galaxy, and, and that's what's easiest to measure, a shearing of the image of that galaxy. So this is just a sketch. There's this background galaxy. Here's this foreground matter. The light path goes past that foreground matter. What you see is a sheared image, greatly exaggerated, uh, as this sort of blue banana. And this shear that you measure is directly related to the foreground matter distribution, which is why you can learn about the foreground measure, matter distribution by measuring that shear. And so. It's just a sketch of that actually happening in a cluster. That's what astronomical images look like. You take a picture of the sky. Most of these dots are galaxies. The yellow ones are in the foreground. Most of the blue ones are in the background. And you can tell that actually some of the blue galaxies around that cluster, they look just like in that sketch. That's a strong lensing going on. But all these tiny blue dots here, they're also stretched very slightly. And their statistical alignment tells us about the matter distribution in the foreground. OK, so we used this sort of information 
in the science verification data of DES to make the largest map of dark matter to date. Uh, it looks like this. You see sort of underdense and overdense parts of the sky. But that map uh, is now superseded by a much larger map uh, that's out to date, uh, that's out today, um, mapping dark matter over the whole uh, region of this SPT contiguous field using 26 million sheared galaxies whose shapes we have measured based on our DES data. And so, you know, there's a great increase in statistical power. That means we have a great systematic responsibility of treating this data right. Uh, there's a series of papers describing these steps, so let me summarize here. Um, we have this unprecedented size and depth of photometric data, uh, so we need to take great care in processing that data and calibrating it correctly, as described in this paper. We then need to measure the shapes of galaxies, and we need to estimate their redshifts using the DES photometry. The way we do it is we always use two independent ways. There's two independent ways of measuring shapes and photometric redshifts and of calibrating those photometric redshift distributions so we can cross-check and make sure none of them goes terribly wrong, all of which is described in these papers and some papers that are going to be released very soon. On the analysis part, we have a full and validated treatment of the covariance of all the signals we measure, including nuisance parameters, nuisance parameters that describes things we might have you know, not know quite well, know, things we might not know perfectly about our measurement, but also nuisance parameters like the mass of neutrinos that affects uh, these cosmological signals. And so finally, uh, we use a theory and simulation tested blind analysis using two independent codes that we check give the same answer, cosmo-like and cosmosis. And so really all these steps took work by a large group of people that, uh, you know, I'm just representing here. Okay, so let's go to the first science result, which is measurements of cosmic shear, uh, Troxel et al. released to date. And I'll just try to explain how cosmic shear works. Um, the light from distant galaxies, like these cyan ellipses here, on the way to us here at the CTIO telescope, passes the same foreground structure. And so that foreground structure affects the light paths of those galaxies. We measure the shapes of those galaxies, uh, and in DESY1, we have measured 35 million shapes of galaxies in our primary, sh primary shape catalog using the meta-calibration pipeline, which is a new way of self-calibrating these shape measurements described in these papers. We've calibrated those measurements to uh, an accuracy of below 1.3% multiplicative uncertainty. We have independent shape measurements using the M3 shape software that we had used before in DSSV, and that is calibrated very differently using realistic image simulations that are described in another paper uh, released today. And then we sent these two catalogs through a suite of predefined detailed tests for systematic effects that you can read about in the Cosmic Shear paper and also in the Shear Catalog paper that has been released today. So that's something we're quite proud of. Um, all these galaxies, you see the density of galaxies here that we've measured shapes for, and this region called SPT that we use for the cosmology analysis. Then, next thing we do is we measure the correlation of the shapes of galaxy pairs. Because they have passed the same foreground structures, the shapes of those galaxies, while they're intrinsically unrelated, if they're a different redshift, look the same direction. And because it's a pseudo-vector field, you need two components to describe this. But what this plot is just showing is, as a function of separation of pairs of galaxies, how strongly their shapes are aligned in, uh, in the sky. And so the beautiful thing about this measurement is these points here do contain error bars. Uh, they're just sometimes smaller than the data points, which for cosmic shear, uh, which is a very difficult and noisy measurement to make, is, is really a great achievement. Then we split these galaxies into tomographic bins. We don't just use all of them at the same account, but we split them into four bins by their redshift. We estimate their redshift distributions using three different methods. We calibrate the means of those redshift distributions using two different methods, redshifts of galaxies in the Cosmos survey, where you know redshifts very well, and the cross-correlation of these galaxies with luminous red galaxies, of which we know the redshifts very well, described in this series of papers. And we use the auto and cross correlations 
of the galaxy alignment between those four bins as our signal. And so then finally, we constrain cosmological parameters. Uh, and you know, if there are any gasp in the audience, we first do that blindly. Okay, so this plot here shows the result from Planck on matter density and the structure of uh, the amplitude of structure formation, the result from the cosmic shear survey performed by kids uh, released earlier, and blinded results from cosmic shear and DS. These are not, you know, this is not our actual centroid, but this is all we knew a month ago. We didn't know what our answer would be before we passed all these tests. But what you can tell from this plot is that the constraining power is, is quite excellent. Uh, it's the best and most precise cosmic shear measurement made to date. If you want to see the unblinded results, I'm not going to show them here for dermatological purposes, but you can find them in Troxel et al. All right, so that's just one part of our analysis. The full information that we want to find about cosmology is contained in this matter density field, which is unfortunately not observable. So I've told you about one proxy, which is this convergence field, what Lensing sees. It's a projected version, and it's noisy, but you can measure its correlations, and that's what cosmic shear does. There's another proxy, which is the positions of galaxies that we find in our survey. And so the clustering of those galaxies tells you about the clustering of the matter field. And there's a paper describing the details and systematic tests on the angular clustering of red galaxies in our survey, also released today. And then you need to connect these two. You need to know how these galaxies trace the matter field. And the way to do that is, again, gravitational lensing that tells you how much matter there is around these, these galaxies. And that's a method called galaxy-galaxy lensing that, again, is released to date. So, so the trick is that the combination of these three two-point measurements of matter density field proxies maximizes the use of the information that we get from the survey. It also jointly and robustly constrains nuisance parameters, like the uncertainties in multiplicative shear bias or photometric redshifts, as many people have remarked um, over the last decade or so. And so in this analysis, we use the largest individual data sets. And for the first time, we make a joint cosmological constraint from these three probes, the angular clustering of photometric galaxies galaxy-galaxy lensing around those galaxies, and cosmic shear using those same background galaxies. And that's the main cosmology paper that's been released today. So just to show you the remaining measurements of galaxy clustering and galaxy-galaxy lensing described in these two papers, um, the thing to mention here is that as, this, as these lens galaxies and as the galaxies whose clustering we measure, we use a sample of luminous red galaxies called red magic. That's an algorithm of selecting these and assigning them high quality estimates of redshift based on DES photometry uh, that works very well. And so we can measure the clustering of these galaxies as a function of their separation in the sky in five different redshift bins of lens galaxies that we formed. We can also measure the tangential shear signal around these galaxies. Again, five different redshift bins of lens galaxies, four different redshift bins of source galaxies uh, and shown in a spot. And these are very high signal to noise measurements of how these galaxies trace the matter field. And then, before we can combine these two ways of probing the matter field, we, fir we first need to make sure that they actually give consistent results. Otherwise, combining them makes no sense. And so that's what this plot, which is still blind, is showing. Um, if you look at the cosmology results from shear, so from cosmic shear, and the cosmology results from the combination of galaxy clustering and galaxy-galaxy lensing, um, they appear in very different, in very similar positions in this plot. Um, the criterion we really used to decide whether or not they're consistent is the base factor. Uh, so that's a, a ratio of evidences that in this case tells us that these two experiments seem to measure the same underlying cosmology. So passing this test and 11 other tests that we did before unblinding, we can finally look at cosmological results. And here they are. So this is matter density this is the structure of amplitude in the late time universe. The, uh, this Planck contour here shows results from the cosmic microwave background. The orange contour is these results that we have found from DSY1. Now, the intriguing question is, what does that even mean, right? So there's an, there's an offset of the central uh, locations of these contours. Is that a significant finding, or are these two things uh, consistent? And so if you look at the detailed statistics of that model, 
um, we find that there is a consistency of this measurement of the late universe with measurements that Planck has made of the cosmic microwave background. Um, this is the first time that the CMB Planck and this late time measurement with lensing actually constrains these cosmological parameters with equal strength. Um, the difference that you see in central values here is between one and two sigma. It's in the same direction as earlier results have found, but one or two sigma is not a significant difference uh, to report. And our main criterion for judging consistency is the base factor, uh, which in this case is 4.2. There's no evidence that these two things are inconsistent. They're actually perfectly expected results of measuring a cosmology that is somewhere in here with two different experiments. Uh, an interesting, even stronger test you can make is you can combine these low redshift probes. Um, you can combine DES with geometric probes of the low redshift universe, and you get this little orange contour here. And again, we find that that is consistent with Planck. Uh, the evidence ratio is large. So we can actually continue this game and combine Planck with the sum of all these low redshift uh, probes. And so when we do that, this is what we find. You can see here the cyan contours is the sum of DESY1 data, Planck, and these geometric measurements of the late time universe. And I've indicated the fiducial and the CDM model by the red lines. This is a matter density of 0.3. This is a dark energy equation of state that corresponds to a cosmological constant. And then finally, this is a structure formation amplitude that is 0.8. Okay. So these cyan contours are consistent with this fiducial model that I talked about earlier. Um, so a key result here is that DES plus late-time geometry plus CMB yields consistent constraints, uh, the tightest constraints on these parameters that we have found today. Um, the consistency is, is uh, quite clear from the base factor, which is 244 in this combination. And so this combination of probes actually gives us the most precise measurements of these fundamental parameters, the, energy dens the, the matter density of the universe, structure of amplitude formation. In no combination of this data gives us evidence for the dark energy equation of state parameter being different from minus one. Uh, if we combine them all, uh, we get a constraint on W that is minus one um, plus or minus 45%. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, this is a very precise test of this simple model on the CDM. And it shows that if there are any inconsistencies, any discrepancies, then they are smaller than this small uncertainty that we have. Uh, it does, however, not explain lambda CDM in any way. Uh, lambda CDM remains a mystery that we need to solve if we want to understand uh, basic working of our universe. This test is also not very sensitive to models with a time-varying dark energy equation state. And a lot of models do predict that. Um, and so. This forecast here just shows you what we can do combining more probes and using the full data that DES will, co will collect. Uh, constraints on not just the present value of the dark energy equation of state, but also its change with time. Right now, geometrical probes give you a very broad constraint. Combining these with all the cosmological probes that we get out of DES final data, we will be able to constrain these parameters uh, much more precisely. And then, yeah, that's really the way to go. We need to collect more data. We need to combine them, if they're consistent, to really find out what's happening in the universe. To summarize, um, a wide range of probes from the early, very early universe and the late universe, um, using geometry of the universe and growth of structure, agree remarkably well in a fiducial lambda CDM cosmology. DES has added to this the most precise measurement of structure in the evolved late time universe. Uh, these results are competitive with Planck and they're consistent with Planck in their constraining power on omega matter and sigma eight. The offsets between them are insignificant, but they go in the direction that other lensing studies have found. We get the most precise joint measurements combining these probes of these fundamental parameters and they're remarkably close to 0 0.3, 0 0.8 and minus one. You can read all the details on this in the papers that are released now online on the collaboration website. And by talking to DES collaborators in the audience who will be wearing uh, this little tag here, um, 
But what we really need is even more precise and different models that we can test to understand how dark energy works. And that is really work in progress. Thank you. Well, thanks, Daniel. Great talk. And thanks to the whole DES team. I mean, these are, these are really remarkable results. Very, very impressive. I, I suspect there might be one or two questions. Uh, there's one there very fast. <laughs> You said that you have now, you will add the time varying and a dark energy into your models, right? Is it possible, remotely possible, that might change your whole paradigm? Uh, yeah, so I mean, if we do find evidence after lots of testing, for sure, um, that the equation of state parameter of dark energy is not constant in time but changing then that would require a whole new model. That, that would mean uh, dark energy can't be this cosmological constant, but something else must be going on. Now, depending on what exactly we find and what direction we find an offset from that, I'm sure theorists will have something uh, worked out already that agrees with that. OK. OK, yeah, done. How, how was the patch of sky selected? What properties made it good? So in this sort of survey, well, there's two things, really, right? We have a telescope sitting in Chile, uh, which means we want to observe the southern sky. Uh, there's another thing is you want to avoid the galaxy as much as you can, because the galaxy contains a lot of stars, a lot of dust that make your calibration difficult and destroy some of your survey area. And then one other thing that led to choosing this field of view is the South Pole Telescope survey. So we have a great overlap with the, with the field of view uh, or with the area observed for the South Pole Telescope survey. So we can do all sorts of cross-correlation studies between these seam beam measurements and between the, the clusters that SPT has found and the DS optical data. Some of them are out, and some of them are, are coming shortly. Uh, and you know, that really increases the, the power of that data set uh, quite a lot. Okay. So if you go to the next slide, I'm not sure I understand what sigma 8 is. And it's especially, well, it's confusing me because it's close to 0 0.7. So, but, um, so what's the oh, uh, uh, physical meaning of the 0 0.8? Yeah, so the sigma 8, sorry. Sigma 8. So sigma 8 is, is an amplitude of structure formation. Um, the details of the definition don't really matter. But if you just take different volumes in the universe and you measure the, me you measure the over density or under density of matter in those volumes, they will have some variance. And so the, the width of that curve is, in some definition, 0 0.8. And so that's consistent with what all these other probes have measured. You might be confusing this with um, omega lambda, the energy density of the cosmological constant. So all these, all these uh, analyses assume the universe to be flat, which we know is the case um, very precisely. So omega lambda is 0.7 indeed in these analyses. So on, this may be an unfair question, and, and maybe somebody else can answer it in the audience, but, but since you have great agreement with Planck, which is, you know, it's fantastic, um, and Planck is sensitive to relativistic degrees of freedom and neutrino masses. If Planck, is there a joint analysis that you, that you now together with Planck can pick up constraints and then tighten the predictions on relativistic degrees of freedom and neutrino masses? And neutrino masses. Yeah, so, so in fact, we show some of this in the paper. I, have, I didn't show it in the talk, but um, there are constraints, joint constraints from this data and Planck on neutrino mass that lift the limit on neutrino masses by a bit. DES is not very sensitive to neutrino mass, as you said, uh, Planck is. And if you, let's just look at, let's just look at this plot. Uh, yeah, look at this plot. So basically, the width of this, this direction sort of is the direction of neutrino mass. If neutrinos have little mass, then Planck gives you constraints like that. If they have the maximum allowed mass, then Planck gives you constraints like that. So the, the combination of these things means that neutrinos can't be that massive because then these two things would disagree. Read the paper, thank you. Any further questions? Dimitri. Yep, down here. <laughs> so can you say a few words, so no, you plan to reduce uncertainties because that's the 
game here, so reduce the uncertainties. So are you going to survey larger part of the sky? So what, what's actually improving? It's not statistics like what we do in particle physics, right. so you need something else. Here. Yeah, so there's two things that add to the width of this contour, um, or maybe three things. One is, one is just the size of our data. If we collect data over a larger area, if we collect deeper data that it contains more galaxies, these statistical uncertainties will go down. The second is systematic uncertainties in our measurements, our measurements of shear, our measurements of photometric redshifts. They don't actually contribute very much to this, to the size of this contour, but they have, have a contribution. So if we, if we can improve those methods, the contours will shrink a bit. Uh, and then the third thing is being able to model even smaller scales. So in this analysis, we were very careful to exclude small scales that are theoretically difficult to model and where different models of what baryons do, for instance, give you different predictions. If we can be more confident in modeling these small scales, we could actually shrink these contours quite a lot today. Uh, it's just that, you know, we, we aren't. Uh, that, that needs progress in simulating and, and modeling physical effects on small scales. Okay, right, right up there at the back. <laughs> Do the new results resolve some of the conflict in the determination of the Hubble constant? So we're not very sensitive to the Hubble constant in these results, um, but there is a degeneracy between things like the matter density and the Hubble constant in the C and B determination. So that means if you, you know, if you shift the matter density a bit, which this does, right? This is the matter density that Planck would constraint on its own, and then the matter density that the combination of the two constraints is a little bit to the left. Uh, the Hubble constant that Planck measures moves up by a bit, so the discrepancy gets a little bit smaller, but it doesn't resolve, uh, it doesn't resolve the discrepancy overall. Okay, we have time for one more question. Oh, down there, Jay. I think it's Jay. Okay, it's on now. This is sort of a follow-up question uh, of uh, Dimitris. Uh, so you, you said that the, uh, one of the uh, uncertainties that could reduce is, um, is the modeling uncertainty. Does that actually shift the central value of those two blobs as well? Well, it depends which model is right, really. You know, we, we don't know which way it would go. It would greatly decrease the uncertainty, but it depends how exactly galaxies trace the matter field on small scales and how baryons affect the power spectrum of matter density fluctuation on small scales, which way it would go. It could go but, either way. But the question that I was asking is that those are two experimental results, right? Right. So, so they, you know, they're looking at the same quantity, therefore their central value shouldn't change. That's true, but th these contours are not very sensitive to the small scale physics because the Planck measurement is made at an early time in the universe when structure didn't form yet. So the density fluctuations are very small. So these complex physics that are caused by essentially supernovae and active galactic nuclei that blow out baryons, they didn't happen yet when Planck, you know, when the signal that Planck is measuring was emitted. So mm -hmm. these, these small scale um, problems that I'm talking about, they only affect the late time measurement. They don't affect the CMB measurement. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think if there are any other questions, I would suggest people seek out the T-shirts and the badges. There are lots of people around uh, who, who will be able to answer your questions. So, so we should thank Daniel again and thank all of the speakers. It was a great session.